we should never enter these sacred places without going uh, opening in prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've allowed us this privilege of gathering together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to open your word to us. We pray, Father, that you would open your word to us, and more importantly, open us to your word, that in all these things we might behold Jesus Christ, that we might grow in grace in the knowledge of him, and, and, doing, and in all this become more fruitful stewards of the incredible abundance you've allowed each of us. As we commit our, this evening and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we are in session three of the, our study of the book of Revelation. Chapters uh, two and three, of course, are the seven churches, and so we're going to focus on each one specifically. But just a few background items for, to get warmed up here. Notice, first of all, it's singular. The word revelation, uh, uh, the, the Greek word apocalypsis, means the unveiling. It's not a collection of visions. It's an unveiling of a person, the person of Jesus Christ. It's singular. It's the consummation of all things. Everything started in Genesis is tied off in a Revelation. And it's the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. No other book of the Bible, to my knowledge, promises a special blessing to the reader of it. Lots of admonitions to read the Bible collectively, the Word of God. Only one book has the, what the Jews might call chutzpah, <laughs> to uh, say, read me, I'm special. And we're going to claim that blessing tonight. The, the book contains 404 verses, but the important thing to understand is that those 404 verses contain over 800 allusions to the Old Testament. So if it sounds strange to your ears, it's because we all haven't done enough homework in the Old Testament. And we'll provide a, a, an actual catalog of all those allusions as part of the notes that will accompany the study. And of course, this presents the, this, uh, presents the climax of God's plan for mankind. Now notice the first couple of verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto whom? Unto Him. That shocks many people. They read that, but they don't, they're not paying attention. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him, to Jesus Christ. To sh why? To show unto His servants things which must suddenly come to pass, shortly. The word in the Greek is taxi. It, it uh, means very rapidly once they start. I think the closest English word is really suddenly. Once they start, they'll be quick. And he sent and signified it, signified it, rendered it into signs uh, by, uh, by his angel unto the servant John, who bear record of, the, of uh, the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. You're going to, if you watch carefully as you go through the book, you see John sees things, he hears things, he feels things, he falls in the ground. This is a very, very dynamic, uh, physically interactive experience that John is going to experience. Okay. Let me sign up it. Run it into signs. And verse 3 is, has the equivalent several places in the book. We'll just grab it here while we're here. It's a blessing that you and I are going to claim right now. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then he goes on, of course, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. You'll understand the book itself is like a, a, a package that's being sent, not to one church, to all seven. Each of the seven churches will have a part of it, but they'll also get the whole thing, if you will. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. The word Asia, of course, is not the continent as we use the term. It's the proconsular Asia. It's, it's a province of the Roman government. It's the area that you and I think of today as Turkey. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from, a, from our sins in his own blood. Here we have a trinity allusion, from him which is, which was, and which is to come, which many of us would visualize as the Father, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And then we have between these two this interesting phrase, the seven spirits which are before his throne. Some scholars think that seven key angels that are going to show up later, but most of us, I think, see that as the sevenfold Holy Spirit 
as detailed in Isaiah chapter 11, first couple of verses. But in any case, this is just by way of review and warm-up. The key thing that I want us all to be sensitive to as we go, that we're dealing with an integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And in this case, it's the other way around. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. We're dealing with a single book. And our whole premise of our approach to this book is the recognition that every detail is there deliberately. That's true of the whole Bible, but it's especially true book of Revelation. Every subtlety, every detail, even the structure will tell us things that are uh, below the surface. And we'll try to highlight some of those as we go. Now in chapter 1, we had an introduction, then the salutation occasion. Then the main core of chapter 1 is a vision of the risen Christ that we went through last time. But just to go through it quickly, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That is not Sunday. Many people assume it's Sunday. It's the day of the Lord. It's a very common phrase in the Old Testament, and uh, Joel and others talk about it. I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. What kind of a trumpet is important, but we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 8 and following. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to uh, Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and to Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Seven churches. Now, one of the questions that should lurk in your consciousness as we go through all of this, why these seven? 63 years since Pentecost and the giving of the Holy Spirit, there are now over 100 churches around, and many of those were in the proconsular Asia, not just these seven. Why not Rome, Jerusalem, Antioch, Colossae, Philippi, Galatia, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, Miletus, and uh, so on and so forth? You yourself familiar with the New Testament, can list a whole bunch of churches, many of which you would think are far more prominent than these seven. Why were these seven chosen? Don't answer now. Keep, that, keep your options open as we go forward. I think you'll be startled to realize how uniquely these churches fit a, some very complex models. John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, lampstands are light bearers, not the source of light. And before the chapter's over, they'll be explained what they actually are. And the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the the chest with a breastplate, in effect. Now, uh, we have a physical description of Christ here in heaven. And there's there's much to it. There's a whole section that uh, I'll just summarize in a minute. But he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The sharp two-edged sword, you see some artists try to literally rend that, re- render that in a painting, and it's, of course, grotesque. The term is an idiom for what? What's the sharp two-edged sword, anyone? The Word of God, exactly. Three or four times in the New Testament, that's exactly what it is called. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, and that all should echo Matthew 17, the transfiguration. But anyway, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And last time we went through the seven occasions where that phrase is used of Jesus Christ in the Old and New Testament. And uh, so we won't go through, but that's, each one of these things, I encourage you to have a concordance at your side. And every one of these phrases that strikes your ear strange, get a concordance, find out where else they, where else they appear, and it'll all... Uh, the fog of lift. But the vision of chapter 1 had seven features. His hair on his head was white. It was taken from Daniel 7 verse 9 in effect. His eyes is a flame of fire. And that's, bear in mind it's a simile. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, his feet, which is a symbol of the walk. The brass of judgment. We talked about the brazen serpent and all of that last time. He had a voice of many waters. Uh, how do you argue with Niagara Falls? I mean, it's not a whisper. It's not the little still small voice that Elijah heard. No, this is something far more, uh, 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 much stronger. In his right hand, he has seven stars. Now, it's interesting, these lampstands, he's in the midst of them on the one hand, at the same time, they're all pictured as in his hand. Now, that's a paradox. How can he be in among them and have them in his hand? But what is it talking about? That he's among us and he is in control. A idiom taken from John 10 and elsewhere. Is out of his mouth the two-edged sword, we've talked about that, which has a number of functions. It judges the believers, it smites the earth, and it ultimately consumes the Antichrist. And, of course, everything's in seven. The seven elements here finish with the countenance as the sun. 
But then we get to verse 19. The reason I'm going through this review of chapter 1, because it's important to have this perspective before we jump in to this, the most important section of the book of Revelation, which is chapters 2 and 3, and I'll show you why. Revelation provides its own outline. And uh, in verse 19, John is told to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. A little short verse, but the things which thou hast seen. When you get to verse 19, what has he seen? The vision of Christ in chapter 1. It's now behind us. So that's the things that he has seen. Write the things which are, present tense. That's the seven churches that will emerge in chapters 2 and 3. And then the thing which, that which follows after the churches in chapters 4 through 22. The word hereafter in the English is actually a translation of the Greek metatauta. And chapter 4 verse 1 is that, key, is that signal word metatauta and goes on. So we'll, we'll show you why we hold the view. And by the way, something else let me underscore. We're not here to uh, try to indulge in controversies. That we, we're really here to teach, to encourage you to do your own study. We will share what we believe and why we believe it. We'll try to highlight the alternative views when we, as we go, but uh, we're not here to sell a particular view as much as we will put it out f- candidly to help you with your study, but we're assuming that you will use Acts 17.11 as your guide. That's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Mister tells you, but search it out for yourself. Speaking of the Bereans. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all openness of mind, but they searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. But uh, so on, there are many good scholars that will not agree with some of the views that we're going to present. And I just want you to be aware of that, and you should uh, resolve it with your own study. But it's chapters 2 and 3 that we feel are the key to the book. The reason is that's the part that we are involved in. We believe that we, we, we will be in heaven from chapter 4, verse 1 onward. And we'll sh- it's a very strange view, not held by everyone, but we'll show you why we hold that view as we go. So the last verse of the chapter is really just a prep for verse, chapters 2 and 3. Um, John writes, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lamps, lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. And by the way, one thing you'll notice if you peek ahead, the lampstands are on the earth in chapter 1. They are in heaven in chapter 4. I'm not building a case on that. There's more more convincing issues, but I mentioned that in passing. So we are now going to explore the seven churches, the things which are. And one of the questions is why these seven? Keep keep that open and, and, and jot your notes as we go forward. One of the things you'll discover is each letter has a closing phrase. It has, a, it has a, a title of the church. It has a title that Jesus chooses of himself. He takes one of the identities from chapter 1 to, reflect, to refer to himself. It's a different one for each church. For, it's all consistent with the theme of the church. Then it's like a report card, and I'll show you that in a minute. But it, each one closes with this strange phrase. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, this has this, these four letter, these seven letters have four levels of application. The first one's pretty obvious. They were real local churches at the time, and they've been investigated thoroughly by the experts. Sir William Ramsey uh, uh, established quite clearly their existence and the fact that they had problems at this time that these letters seem to address head on. So they have a very valid local application. And you could say, gee, that's it, that's enough. No, there's more to that. You notice that the Holy Spirit says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. In other words, every church was to pay attention to what was said to each of the seven. So it's an admonitory uh, application to each church. Every church that you can find on the planet Earth will have elements of all seven in it, some more than others. Once you understand the seven letters, each one has a theme, each one faced certain problems, each one had certain recommendations. All of them ap- apply to all churches to varying degrees. And that's if you understand those seven, you can map any church you run into as how much it has two, two, te- two teaspoons of this one and four tablespoons of that one or whatever. You follow me? Okay. So it, it's, that makes sense. But there's a third level. 
It is homiletic, personal. How many of you have an earlobe? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, it says, he that hath an ear, that's you. Let him hear, him, him or her, uh, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there is a sense, very clear sense, in which each of these seven letters apply to us personally, independent of what church you might be attending. Are we together so far? Now, so far we're on sound ground. Very few people will have much quarrel with that. But fashion your seatbelts. There's a fourth level that's prophetic. And this is very controversial. There are some that would take exception to this, but I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions. But I'll point out to you that in the order that they're in in your Bible, they will profile the history of the church from the apostolic day to today. And if they were in any other order, that would not be true. And so that having been said, we of course will be exploring that as we go. Now this prophetic profile, we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what I'm going to try to show you as we go forward, that each of these have an implied future, and some of those futures are very, very startlingly different. Something else I'll try to remember to point out as we go, but let me mention it right up front. One of the key lessons you'll get from this study is that every one of the seven churches was surprised by the result. Because each of the letters by Jesus Christ is a report card. Here's what you've done good, here's what you need to work on. Just like a report card. Every one of the seven churches was surprised. Those that thought they were doing well were not. Those that were, thought they were not doing well were doing a lot better than they thought. So this should give us some humility. So whatever you think of your church... You want to hold an abeyance and measure it against Jesus Christ's report cards to these seven and come to your own conclusions. And we'll work this as we go. You'll also discover as you go that there are seven elements of each of the church, each of the seven letters. If you can, if you can visualize a spreadsheet with seven rows and seven columns, make each column a church, you'll have seven rows, the name of the church, the title of Christ, his commendations, his concerns, his uh, exhortations. Well, I'll go through this. Uh, first of all, the name of the church. You'll tr discover that the name of the church is very relevant to the main theme of the church. Jesus Christ chooses a title to refer to himself that's selected from one of the titles uh, drawn from chapter 1. But each one's different because each one has a slightly different emphasis. Then he has a commendation. Here's what you did well. Here's your A's. Got an A in this and an A in this, a B in this, not bad. But then he has his concerns. Whoops. You get to this word, nevertheless, and you hold your breath. Then, of course, he has an exhortation, gives him some specific advice. Then you have a promise to the overcomer. In the letter, there is a specific promise to the individual in that situation. And then you have the last thing is the closing phrase. He that hath an ear, uh, hear what the Spirit says. By the way, th that phrase, he that hath an ear, occurs outside of the book of Revelation, seven other places. So on the final exam, it says, how many times is as he that hath an ear show up? Don't say seven, it's 14. Seven in Revelation, seven elsewhere. But that's a hint. Let's go on here. So you could make a spreadsheet of these seven churches, Ephesus through Laodicea, and you, you can take each name and what it means, the title it's used, take the commendation, the concerns, the exhortation, the promise of the overcomer, and then this last phrase. And what I encourage you to do in your private study is to take a large sheet of paper that can be laid out horizontally and paste in the text in all the squares to give you the spreadsheet. I could hand one out, but I'd rather you just do it yourself because it'll be, it's, a, it's a worthwhile exercise for yourself, for your own notebook. Um, what I'd like to do at this point, let's take your Bibles and let's read together I could have put it on the screen too, but I thought I don't want to develop bad habits here. I think it would be, be useful for us to actually get your Bible. We've got the lighting improved thanks to some donations that came in, so we've got better light now and more comfortable seats. The seats are now I can talk two or three hours without getting comfortable. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do believe in the spiritual gifts minus flippancy. Okay, chapter 2, verse 1. Read, just read along with me. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he 
that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden ca candlesticks. The word candlesticks is the King James, and more pro it's looking in the Greek, it's really a lampstand. Verse 2, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, for my name's sake has labored and hast not fainted. That's the good news. Then you get to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The first seven verses constitute the letter to Ephesus. Well, let's just take it apart. The word Ephesus in the Greek means the desired one. The desired one. An equivalent term is darling. The one and only. Interesting, interesting label. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Then we have the title of Jesus Christ that he chooses of himself. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars at his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. You know, it's interesting. These are, this is, of course, the phrase we just read in chapter 1. It's very familiar in years at this point. But I want you to notice the paradox of the care here. He is walking among us, and yet we are in his nail-scarred hand. The emphasis here is that Jesus is present, and he's in control. And that's something, that's, that's a theme I encourage you to study as you go through your Gospels. You realize that the Lord, that the betrayal of Judas was not Judas's timing. The Lord precipitated it by announcing it that night. They had not planned to take him on a feast day. That's expressed in the scripture because they feared the Romans. But Jesus, by announcing it that night, controls the timing. Judas had a split and he had a fisher cut bait. So they had to throw their arrangements together that night. And when you get to Gethsemane, who's giving all the orders? Not the soldiers. Whom seek ye? I said I'm he. If, if I you seek, let them, go their, let them go their way. Who's giving all the orders? Jesus is. All the way through. He, it, it, uh, Bell Gibson did, I think, a remarkable job in his film, The Passion. But there is a misconception that emerges by the average person seeing it. The crucifixion was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. Jesus Christ, that's what he came to do. He deliberately arranged things to fulfill it's hundreds of details. But anyway, notice he's in control. Key point, key point here. Um, okay, uh, Ephesus, desired one. It's a term of endearment, obviously. Verse 2. I know thy works. You know, that can go, that's on our report card too. As Jesus writes your report card, it might, it'll probably say, I know thy works. Whatever you're doing, good and bad, he knows about. I'm told a little, a little, uh, Grandson asked his grandpa, can God see me all the time? He's told he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. Great answer, great answer. <laughs> I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. In other words, they did a good job at digging out heresy about clinging to sound doctrine. They apparently did that in a very good way. And has borne and has patience for my name's sake and has labored and has not faded. Now without counting, how many commendations do you think they got? Seven. Good for you. <laughs> good guess. If you go through and count them, there's seven. I think it's impossible for you to make a list of all the sevens in the book of Revelation. You can get up to a hundred and get tired by then because many of them are so subtle it really takes some digging, but they're everywhere. And we'll, we'll highlight a few as we go. Everybody knows about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, seven bowls. Hey, that's just, that's just for starters. Testing doctrines. You know, Paul gave a warning to the elders of this church. Timothy was probably his first bishop. 
And his, the fair, Paul's farewell to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, what you should do for, in preparation for this uh, uh, session was to read Acts 18 to 20, which is a great deal of background on the uh, uh, Ephesian church. So Paul had his farewell warnings. We'll look at them in detail in a minute. But John himself also gave some warnings in his first and second epistles. And we'll take a quick look at those in a little bit. But I said there were four levels of application. Let's start with the local picture. There really was a church in a place called Ephesus. And let's find out a little bit about it. It was founded in about 1400 B.C. with a very early temple to an ancient Hittite de uh, fertility de de deity, which became identified, of course, later with Artemis or Diana. The Ionian colonists from Athens settled there about 1100 B.C. When you get up to about 6th century B.C., the Lydians captured the city. And then Croesus, their king, was routed by the Persians, and Ephesus was joined to the other cities in the Ionian Confederation. It was about this time that we see a Diana or Artemis surface in their cultural uh, traditions. And uh, Ephesus was involved in the Peloponnesian Wars to its disadvantage, and, uh, it, but it, served as a key, it was a key naval base in those days. Uh, it has problems later. It fell to the Macedonians under Alexander, and after when Alexander dies, as you may recall, uh, four of his key generals took over his empire. Lysimachus became master of the city and tried to make it a model city, really, you know, really uh, made it very elaborate. And uh, again, Ephesus seems to have a, an ability to pick the wrong sides of battles. They, saw, they unwisely sided with Antiochus of Syria against the Romans. They eventually, though, do become a Roman capital of, their, of what, the Roman province of Asia, the western part of uh, the eastern part of uh, Turkey is, is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, proconsular Asia, uh, the, the province of Asia. But it, did have, it was a free city, so that meant it had its own municipal government and senate. And both Strabo and Josephus are sources on background if you want to get into that. It was called the Queen of Asia. It was one of the most beautiful cities in the region. It was the capital of Ionia, and it had the chief harbor. That's why it was a naval base earlier, and that's why it... it, it uh, Continued to be a key naval base. However, the Romans uh, tore up all the trees, which caused erosion, and that erosion started to fill the harbor. So the harbor became more and more problematical to where today it's six miles inland. And so, uh, but it was extremely wealthy and beautiful in those days. It was near uh, a, the mouth of the River Caister, which is now the Meander. And uh, it was the principal line of communication between Rome and the eastern provinces. And there are three key roads that pass through Sardis and Galatia and so forth. And uh, that made it, it was, on a, it was in a very, very strategic location. It's interesting how Paul would always target his activities at a major crossroads. He was very shrewd um, in his choices. To give you a quick feeling of this, you may, last time we talked about where Patmos was. Uh, we'll zero in on Patmos just as, as a frame of reference here. But Ephesus is along <coughs> the west coast of uh, this of the uh, province called Asia, and we'll talk more about that as we look a little more at the geography. The uh, architecture is astonishing. You have a theater there that is 495 feet in diameter, held 25,000 people. Uh, there's a marble way. I'll show you some pictures of all of this with statues and so forth um, through the city. There's a main way that's almost 2,000 feet long, 70 feet wide. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute here. And they, there is apparently what some scholars feel was the first bank, they say, in the world. I'm not sure that's true, but it certainly was a major... The priests at the Temple of Diana were also major international bankers, in, in, and that was one of the sources of power. If you go there, the digs are extensive. Of all the seven churches to visit, Ephesus is the easiest one to get to and the most fruitful to visit. Anyway, the, the, the digs there are very extensive. Here's a picture as you go down to the, from the main area, down to the, what's called the library. The, that's just the facade there. The library had 200,000 volumes, and that was before printing. Think about it. What they also won't normally tell you unless you have um, some access here. To the right of us is the main way, and down the main way are shops and the brothels. And the archaeologists have discovered there's a tunnel from the library to the brothels. <laughs> so if your husband signed out to the library, girl, do you want to check that out there? <laughs> this is just swing to the right. This is the main way, and some of the brothels are on the right side there. Uh, this is a shot of the theater. 
And perhaps the aerial view is more revealing than the rest. Pretty impressive. And uh, if you get a chance, it's, it, yeah, Ephesus is not hard to get to. It's worth uh, visiting. But in, in the days of the New Testament, the most outstanding architectural feature was the temple to, of Diana, the, who presumably was the daughter of Zeus, the sister of Apollo. And it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was in Ephesus. Four times as large as the Parthenon at Athens. This thing's huge. It stood on a platform of 425 feet by 220. The building itself was 340 by 165 with 127 ionic columns, each 60 feet high. This was, uh, by anyone's standards, an impressive piece of architecture. And, but it's very much involved with very ecstatic uh, sexual rights that we are not in a position to discuss in a mixed audience. It was the largest city of its day. The harbor gradually became unusable, and the traffic was diverted to Smyrna, which is today the city of Izmir. And, uh, but Ephesus was also the study center for arts and magic. And uh, they had all kinds of occultic stuff that was, of course, burned in Acts 19.19, 19, you may recall. Paul's first br uh, visit was brief and was directed towards the Jewish community. He later made a second visit. It was driven from the synagogue, but he settled in the school of Tyrannus for two years until the uproar of 58 AD. And that's all in Acts 19 and 20. And of course, Ephesus later became the center for missionary operations throughout Asia. There were imitators that followed, but without power. You may, be, you may uh, remember the seven sons of Sceva and all that business. Timothy may have become Ephesus' first bishop. And it's here that we find Achilla, Priscilla, Apollos, all these familiar stories from the book of Acts. And... Uh, now, according to Eusebius and some others, uh, John returned there after he finished in Patmos. He was in Patmos for about 10 years. But uh, when uh, Domitian dies, John is released. And he's, uh, the records are that he returned to Ephesus and, and uh, set things, uh, busied himself setting things in order, but he, fin he finished his closing years there. His gospel was apparently written there from Ephesus in those cl closing years. Timothy, John, and Mary's tombs are in Ephesus. After Paul left Ephesus, he journeyed through Macedonia, returned to Miletus, which is near Ephesus, I'll show you that on the map, for his famous farewell to the Ephesian elders. 1 Corinthians, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians was penned during his second visit, and his epistle to Ephesus is written when Paul is later in Rome, four years later after he leaves. Now, uh, the bishop of Ephesus was accorded rank and authority of patriarch over the churches of the whole province of Asia. In 431 AD, we're now showing you a little history after the New Testament period, um, Emperor Theodosius II called a general church council at Ephesus because there was a hot debate at the time as to whether the Virgin Mary should be described as the mother of God. And 200 bishops at this third ecumenical council decided in the affirmative, but that's widely misunderstood. Um, the... Um, the, the, the emperor of the east, Theodosius II, and the Valentinian of the west both com convened this uh, uh, council because of a heresy known as Nestorianism. And Nestorius, who's a patriarch of Constantinople, that is in the east, he refused to accord the title Mother of God to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. But the whole point was the proponents of emphasized the separateness of the human and divine in Christ claiming in effect that he was two persons, one divine and the other human. And accordingly, Mary was considered the mother of man Jesus, not of the divine Jesus. That was the Nestorian's view. But this was opposed to the to accepted doctrine that Christ was a single person at, one, at, the, at once, both God and man. And under the leadership of St. Cyril, the patriarch of Alexander, the council deposed Nestorius and condemned his doctrine. It declared that Jesus Christ is the true God and true man, and that he has two natures, human and divine, joined in one person. So see, on that basis, they're on sound ground. What derives from that, a logical extension of that view, then, the council approved the title uh, Theotokos for Mary, which means God-bearer. Not the mother of God, but the God-bearer. In other words, they're saying Christ was both God-man, and she certainly was his mother, so she was the God-bearer. That gets twisted later to be into the title Mother of God, which, of course, carries a, a much different connotation. And so that, this is often misunderstood. When you look at what really happened in the council, you can't find fault with what they ruled, but the way it's applied is, or twisted later is something else again. Anyway... 
The chief rival of Ephesus was Miletus, but its, its harbor also is a subject of erosion for a while. But uh, even in the first century, Paul landed at Miletus after one of its many dredgings. I'll show you that on the map here in a minute. And it gets destroyed by the Goths uh, in 262. Never, never retains its earlier glory. It, Jesus' letter, the letter we're reading in the book of Revelation, is, is about 35 years after Paul's departure. Now, we want to understand Paul's departure, uh, the, his, his uh, famous, touching uh, farewell address to the elders at Ephesus. Let's pick it up in Acts 20, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. In other words, the Feast of uh, uh, Shavuot. He's trying to get to there. This is one of the three feasts in the Jewish year that was obligatory for an able-bodied Jew to be in Jerusalem, and he's trying to make that commitment. So he doesn't go to Ephesus. He goes, he says, he goes to Miletus. And from Miletus, when he lands in Miletus, he sends word to Ephesus, and he has the elders come to see him. And if you see, there's Ephesus, and there's Miletus. And so the elders have to travel quite a ways. Um, I'm guessing that would be probably uh, more than 20 miles uh, to meet with Paul. Uh, some scholars believe he, Paul did this uh, for two reasons. One is that the harbor was still more useful in Miletus. Ephesus was starting to have... Uh, uh, Erosion problems, silt and so forth. So is Miletus for that matter. But also, they believe that Paul was trying to avoid the crowds. He wanted to deal with just the elders. And so the elders come to Miletus, and that's where Paul uh, has his touching farewell. He says, when they were come to him, he said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Interesting phrase, by the way, house to house. It's interesting to realize that all the fellowships in the book of Acts were in homes, even Acts 2. Churches as we think of them weren't invented until the third, fourth century. House to house. Home fellowships, that was the original form of fellowship. The... Uh, Home fellowships were ostracized by the medieval church, of course. Even the reformers, Calvin and uh, uh, Luther and others, tried to stamp out the home fellowships. And many churches today do not encourage home fellowships. We happen to believe that that's where people really grow. In the 50 years I've been an active Christian, I've seen most of the blossoming of people occur in small fellowships meeting during the week. And we think it's also the viable form for the underground church, which we also think is coming. J. Vernon McGee predicted in America that the real body of Christ is ultimately going to go underground and the attack against him will be led by the denominational churches. That was very radical 20 years ago. It's starting to look very, very real today. Let's get back to Paul. He says, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, they're just full of warnings to Paul what he's facing when he gets back to Jerusalem. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Boy, that's a key phrase. The whole counsel of God. That's our protection against deceit. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, get this now, here he starts hitting it, that after mighty parting shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves enter in among you. It's interesting to realize that these elders heeded his warning. Because 35 years later, when Jesus Christ gives them the report card, they did well in this regard. They were listening. 
He goes, Paul goes on then, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Interesting warning. Also of your own selves shall men arise. And that's exactly what Jesus compliments them for. He commends them for being diligent in that regard. Paul continues, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many have heard that before? <laughs> hey, can you find it anywhere in the Gospels? It may shock you to realize that you won't find that in the Gospels. Here's a quote from Jesus Christ that's by, from Paul. You, I, don't think you, I don't think you'll find it in the Gospels. I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, anyway, let's move on. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed for the, with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing, sorrowing uh, most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So ends that chapter. Now when you get to John, John wrote, in addition to a gospel and the book of Revelation, he also wrote three epistles. First John, which is an extensive, profound epistle, was to Ephesus, by the way. Second John, we believe, was a personal note to Mary. And uh, I won't make into that whole case here. You can just read it. The first sentence pretty makes it pretty clear. And so let's just look at a couple of quotes. In First John 4, John's letter to Ephesus says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. John uses the phrase Antichrist twice, but he doesn't use it of that to which we usually apply it. He's speaking, he's speaking here of the spirit of Antichrist. The, uh, the, the, the one that we call the Antichrist, this coming world leader, has 33 different titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. And, this isn't, this, and John, John, the one that uses the word Antichrist, doesn't use it of him. We get Revelation, so he uses a different phrase altogether, so we'll get into that. But anyway, that's John's warning to the church at Ephesus. Again, echoing the same thing Paul um, dealt with. In his letter to Mary, he has uh, some strange remarks in here. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. It's very interesting as you read 2 John that he is giving both encouragement and exhortation to the one that he was charged to take care of at the cross. And I challenge you to take a look at that, come to your own conclusions about that letter, but let's move on. Oh, um, if there come any of you and bring not this doctrine, and receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. He's warning Mary not to take a false teacher under her roof. Why? We're admonished to show hospitality. Why could she not do that? Because for her to do it would be sanctioning their doctrine. See the difference? Many people try to apply this in general. I think it applies to her. But let's move on. Let's get back to the letter. We had the good news. Jesus commends the, the church at Ephesus for their uh, trying those that say they're apostles or not and found them liars, right? Then we get to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. This is the key line of this entire letter. Because thou hast left thy first love. The word first is protos. It means first in rank, influence, honor, the chief or principal, the superlative love. That's what he's talking about. They have left their first love. They're too busy on the business of the king to have any time for the king. God would prefer to have devotion rather than doctrine. That's the message here. I should say in addition to doctrine. We're talking here of the love of espousal. 
All through the scripture, Old and New Testament, we have the joy associated with salvation. The joy of their salvation is all through Psalm 51, Jeremiah 2, and so on. The first name fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is what? Love, of course. It goes deeper than just these admonitions. God uses the marriage to communicate his most intimate truths. And we're going to see more about that when we get into the harpazo, the rapture, and all of that. And uh, that's the most intimate truth of God, and it's going to be the most startling linkage to the Jewish wedding uh, structure. And if you want to get into uh, this in more depth, I strongly encourage you to some books that have been taught in five continents that have changed lives wherever they land. That's my wife's books called The Way of Agape. And uh, it really, uh, uh, they'll, they'll speak for themselves. There are 20 references to this particular grace found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. That Paul's epistle to the Ephesians is uh, uh, full of this, of course. Now, it's interesting, what we're really asking, what Jesus in effect is saying, he wants Mary's as well as Martha's. You may recall Luke 10, there's the famous incident with Mary and Martha. In Luke 10, starting about verse 38, now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Interesting that Jesus sanctions the fact that Mary sat his feet to learn. And uh, uh, he, he's looking for devotion that outranks everything else. Well, let's get to the, back to the, uh, uh, Jesus' letter. Get to, we're now uh, uh, at verse, uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. You know, it's interesting. The remember, repent, and then re repent again is in the errorist tense. That's intending to envisage no delay. Do it now. And uh, where is the lampstand of Exodus, excuse me, of uh, Ephesians? Where is the lamp of Ephesus today? It's gone. It's gone. There's another little thing that he mentions here, but this thou hast. He has a positive here he throws in. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice he hates the deeds. He doesn't hate the Nicolaitans. And uh, these deeds here will become doctrines in the next letter. We'll talk about it there in more, in more depth. But Nicolaitans. Some scholars suggest the possibility that there was a first century sect claiming apostolic authority for their opinions. Uh, they take this from the name of one of the seven deacons in Acts um, 6, that um, a guy by the name of Nicholas, that he formed a, a sect that was claiming apostolic authority. And there are some scholars that cling to that. There are others that believe that this word is an untranslated word. It comes from the Greek nikeo, which means to conquer or overcome. And laity, or laos, or laity, or people, that this, this, the, the deeds here that was offending Christ is a tendency for the clergy to rule over the laity, creating hierarchies. And uh, Jesus gave us an organization chart the way he saw the church. And he did that in John 13. Remember, he washed their feet. You all know the story. When he did, he says, Then if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So if Jesus was that humble, that gives us the pattern we should follow. And this whole idea of the clergy over the laity is something that apparently offends Jesus Christ. Well, okay, we talked about uh, local. Now let's talk about to, how can this apply to all churches? Well, see, Jesus is acknowledging they did well in having doctrinal purity. 
He has an abhorrence for heresy, of course. But the key thing that they were lacking was devotion to their king. They had left their first love or primary love. Too, business on the business, too busy on the business of a king to, rather than for the king himself. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians deals with this whole issue. It was written from Rome four years after his farewell. And the epistle of Ephesians is very similar to the epistle of Colossians. They're both written about the same time. But Colossians very much has to do with um, uh, theosophy. But Ephesians is simply a letter expressing Paul's love to the church there. And he has this intense desire that they be fully instructed in the profound doctrines of the gospel. So his letter, Ephesians, would be an appropriate appendix to all of this. I encourage you to, it's a little you know, four-chapter book, read it in, in concert with this letter. That brings us to the personal application of this letter. You ever study the difference between David and Solomon? David pervades the scripture. Solomon is mentioned only with adverse comments. The lily of the field was not arrayed like, like these and so forth. And, you know, he, there's always a back of the hand aspect, the comments about Solomon. Well, Solomon sought wisdom very appropriately on the one hand, but yet he later became apostate through his foreign wives. He apparently didn't love the Lord the way David did. David simply sought fellowship. To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The contrast between the two is interesting. Solomon was very wise, but still blew it in the end of his days. David blew it too with Bathsheba and what have you. But he repented. And his heart was focused on, on the Lord. The primary admonition. He wants devotion, not just doctrine. The first commandment. Thou shalt do what? Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, strength. And That's in the Old Testament, the Shema. Deuteronomy 6 5. 1 Corinthians 13 should be read here. No thought of self. If I speak of the, with the tongues of men and of angels and so forth, you know the passage. First love is the abandonment of all for a love that has abandoned all. That's what God is after. So, speaking of other personal applications, I mentioned the third commandment Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I think it's ambassadorship, not vocabulary. I've mentioned that before. And I think that God would have our first priority on our devotional life. And here again, if you want a very astonishing book, a startling book, I encourage you to look at my wife's latest book, Private Worship, The Key to Joy. It's, a com it's an issue of commitment, not melodies. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. Then we get to this closing phrase, he that hath an ear, let him hear what... Spirit says to the churches, but notice something strange here. The promise to the overcomer is like a, after, an afterthought, a postscript. If the he that hath an ear phrase closes the letter, we see to him that overcometh I will, as a phrase that is like a, a, an appendage, like a, like a PS. And that, we're going to discover that's true of the first three letters, but not the last four. And I'm going to suggest to you there's something very interesting about a difference in structure of the different seven letters that we'll out when we've gone through all of them. But in any case, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We all recognize that from Genesis 1. But um, let's just take a look at the... We have uh, Ephesus, the first of these, the first three we're taking. And we, we've got the... We've had the name, the title, the commendation, the concerns, the exhortation, the promise of overcomer. Except when we got to item six, we noticed that it's a postscript. It's underneath the closing. And that doesn't seem to tell us anything yet, but I think it'll tell us a great deal as we go forward. And this tree of life, of course, um, we know it from uh, the Genesis 1. It's also, though, the subject of a lot of myths of the heathen. The Persians have their dreams about it, the Hindus, the Arabs, the Greeks, and Assyria. It's interesting that echoes of this, of Genesis, still echoes even through pagan um, myths and so forth. There's a denouement. I add, Paul's warning in Acts and John's letters uh, warned the Ch Ephesian church. Where's their lampstand today, however? It's obviously gone. Ephesus is now six miles from the sea. It's unapproachable by ship. What was major harbor is now marsh dense with reeds, and what was once the key city in Asia is now a desolation. Worth visiting for ruins, but it's a desolation. Well, that leaves us the last one. And I'm just going to suggest as we close on this 
that uh, this prophetic profile that we talked about, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, the rest, there'll be more meaningful. I'm just going to suggest that Ephesus appears to be a profile of the apostolic church, very diligent on doctrine, and yet lacking in devotion. And um, um, we'll see, uh, Smyrna will be a totally different situation that we'll explore next time. Um, in our next session, I'd like you, as you do for each of these sessions, read chapters 2 and 3. It doesn't take long. Read the whole bunch. But I'd like you to outline the letter to Smyrna. Take those seven elements and see if you can identify the seven elements the letter to Smyrna. I'll give you a clue. Two of them are missing. And if you don't outline it with that structure, you won't notice that they're missing. You follow me? But check it out. But I'm going to have you do something else that may surprise you in preparation for as we go forward. Most of you are aware of the fact that, there, that four disciples came to Jesus for a confidential briefing on His second coming. It occurred on the Mount of Olives. We call that the Olivet Discourse. It's recorded in three Gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. And I think most of us tend to lean on the Matthew account for two reasons. It was a Jewish issue and he was Jewish, but more importantly, he took shorthand. So most of his discourses are more thorough than the others because he, was, he had that as a job, a job skill. You'll find most commentaries will tell you that Matthew chapter 24 and the recording in Luke chapter 21 are the same thing. And I'm going to ask you to read it, not just in Matthew 24, but in Luke 21, and compare them closely and see if they are the same thing. And I think you may discover that they're not. They are different. And they're different in some non-trivial ways. Now, rather than leave that just hanging, i got a few minutes here, let me just throw it in here. The, the, in, in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 10, it mentions false Christs, wars, famines, death, martyrs, and global chaos. Luke does the same thing in, in chapter 21, 4 through uh, the end of the chapter. What makes this interesting to us when we finish the seven churches is we'll discover in the book of Revelation chapter 6, we have the four horsemen and so forth. We'll notice the pattern of the four horsemen and what follows parallels the false Christ, wars and rumors and famines and death and the martyrs and so forth of, of, both, of the Olivet Discourse in both Matthew and Luke. You with me so far? There's a parallelism that's widely recognized by most scholars. Except there's something else that's kind of interesting. It seems that Luke and Matthew have a different focus. Luke mentions that cluster of signs, but he says in verse 12, but before all these, certain things are going to happen. Matthew mentions those same cluster of signs, says all these are the beginning of sorrows, then shall they, in other words, after this, in other words, there seems to be these signs, false Christ, wars, famines, earthquakes, what Luke talks about comes before them, and what Matthew talks about comes after them. Wow. Are they talking about the same thing or are they talking about different things? See, one's before these, one's after, or then shall they? Well, let's try to take another look at this. If that's Luke 21 and that's Matthew 24, the wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth are a cluster of events that sound very much the same in both accounts. No problem so far. But Luke talks about things that happened before those signs, and Matthew, after. Luke talks about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, very clearly. And that occurs before these signs. Matthew talks about destruction, I'll call that desolation number two, that's not only after these signs, it's after an event that Luke doesn't even mention, the abomination of desolation. And it has a destruction of Jerusalem. It has a specific label given to it by Jesus Christ, the Great Tribulation. So suddenly we begin to realize that in this discussion, Luke seems to have focused on the fall of Jerusalem. And he, there's two different desolations. He's focused on the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, clearly. And that's what causes so many scholars who presume that they're just crunched together as one account They're saying, well, gee, what, what, what what the Bible talks about happened back in 70 AD. That did. The other hasn't happened yet. Understand the difference? 
If you do, if this is an example of where I believe precision is valuable because there are all kinds of good scholars stumbling over this issue by not recognizing that Luke's talking, some of the things Luke is talking about is before those signs and what Matthew's talking about is after those signs. And the reason I bring this up here is that, 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 that by the way, see, Matthew is Jewish and he's talking, he's focusing on the time of Jacob's trouble. After these signs, you've got the abomination, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains and so forth. At the fall of Jerusalem, under Luke, it was very similar. Again, Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, but there was an unexplained relaxation of the siege. And the Christians in Jerusalem were able to slip out. That's well documented in Josephus and elsewhere. And then it was reestablished. And of course, they, they had over a million one hundred thousand people slaughtered in those nine months. That's all. That's, we have eyewitness accounts. You can check that out. But the point is, that is not the same event as occurs after the abomination of the desolation, which comes after the same list of signs. You with me so far? So check it out. And uh, I think it'll clear a lot of, of misunderstandings that are going on. But the other thing, the reason I bring it in, the seven letter seven churches are focusing on a period of time after the fall of Jerusalem, but before the war, the, the, uh, before Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. So I thought that would be useful at this point because you're going to want to understand that before we jump into Smyrna to see where they fit in. So read chapters 2 and 3 for next time. Outline the letter to Smyrna, which is, you know, uh, 8, and it's only four, verse, 4 or 5 verses long. It's not very long. And then if you, you get time, you want to study the Solomon Discourse thing because you'll find it's sort of an, uh, 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 an undercurrent and all the rest of it. Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and also Daniel 9 are really essential background aspects to a serious study of the book of Revelation. And so with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's bow our hearts. Father, oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that word became the flesh and dwelt among us. Father, we also ask you to help us to keep the great commandment. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Help us, Father to put you ahead of everything else. As we look at our national horizon, as we look at our personal horizon, we are overwhelmed as we realize how far we've fallen. As we just begin to get a glimpse of the extremes that you've gone to, that we might have life and life eternal. Oh, Father, how that should eclipse everything else on our list of priorities. As we recognize, Father, the clouds on the horizon that are coming, we do pray, Father, that you would illuminate for each of us specifically what you would have of each of us in the days that remain. Not only that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, but that we might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you put before us. Oh, Father, that we might just love you more. We just commit ourselves this night without any reservations whatsoever into your hands to do with us as you will. As we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.